to by looking at themes. Um, we can't go through all um, five Shakespearean characters we're paying attention to as our larger project, which you'll be pleased to know. So we're going to focus on those three, Aaron from Titus, Iago from Othello, and Falstaff just from the first part of Henry IV. So obviously he's in the second part and he's in the Merry Wives, but we're looking at him in one particular play. That's something we can explore later. We're also interested in depictions of deception because we're looking at drama. So someone's decided to represent deception in this way. And for us, that makes deception research easier, in fact. So both of us do deception research, which is outside of Shakespeare. And one of the problems you have is how do you know what's going on inside someone's head? Thanks to Shakespeare and others, we have a sense of what internal dialogue characters have going on because they give us that. They tell us what they're thinking and what they're feeling about other characters. So we're using Bry's definition of deception as a successful or unsuccessful deliberate attempt without forewarning. So you're not letting the other person know you're deceiving them. And, but you want to have in them a belief which you know as the communicator isn't true. So for me, this is all the fun, dark stuff that's in Shakespeare. Um, we're doing four steps to our project. We're going to focus on the first part because that's the bit you've been shown this morning with keyword analysis. But because it's just too interesting and we have got interesting results, we are going to tag on the second step as well. Okay, so just in case there's no one, I'm assuming most people in the room know what keyword analysis is, but if I ask, it's embarrassing to put your hand up and say whether you do or not. <laughs> So just in case, I'm interested in words that occur in text X more often than we'd expect by chance. So if we were paying attention to Tamora, I'd want to know what she says, so a word list of her turns, and then I'd compare it with everything else apart from Tamara's words, and then that would give me her statistical keywords. There's a bit more to it than that, but we don't need to know all those statistical stuff right now. Um, if we do this, for Aaron, the keywords that we get are at the top. So you get things like advance, black, empress, devil, goal, keep, set, the, you, and villainy. And I've given the title here to Aaron's devilish villainy. Now, if you know the play Titus and Andronicus, you know that Aaron um, is a slave, um, and he's a slave that works in tangent with the person he is having an illicit affair with, and together they actually get up to lots and lots of villainy. And it's the villainy that he talks about, and he also tells us what his ambition is, and it's to do with wealth and power. So he talks about this gold must coin a stratagem, and gold there is obviously one of the key words, which is why we've emphasized it, which cunningly affected will beget a very excellent piece of villainy, and so repose sweet gold for their unrest. And so to set the scene, this is him, talking about why he's going to hide the gold, which he can then use to implicate two other characters, Martius and Quintus, in the murder of Bassanius, who's the brother of Saturninus, who's also now emperor and is with Tamora, and it's Aaron and Tamora who are having an affair. And so we have a character who's telling us, I'm a villain, and I'm enjoying myself while I'm being a villain, and his key words are pointing us to that. But he also tells us something through those same keen words about what he thinks of Tamara. And we've suggested that Tamara ends up being his kindred spirit. She's an empress, which is why empress is a key word for him. But he talks about her having a sacred wit and villainy and vengeance that match his. So there's something interesting about this character. He's supposed to be an archetype of a villain and he's black. And for all those reasons, we look at him as quite a traditional character, but how he interacts and relates with other characters suggests he's a little bit more complex than that. And we get that as well if we look at the other keywords. So it'd be really easy to look at these keywords and think, ah, associations between black devil villainy, it's conventional. It's what early modern Europe, early modern European, I'm, I'm making him even bigger than he was, early modern English audiences would have thought at the time is conventional. And there are points at which he is very, very um, archetypal in terms of the type of activities he does. For example, he tricks Titus, the, the Roman uh, victor, 
who's now having his family under great distress, into chopping off his hand in a vain attempt to save Martius and Quintus, who we already know Aaron has set up. And so you get this comment like, how this villainy doth fat me with the very thoughts of it. Let fools do good and fair men call for grace. Aaron will have his soul black like his face. So this idea of that if you're black skinned, you've also got a, a soul that's black as well, which isn't exactly politically correct, is it? Mm -hmm. But that's not who he actually is because he also challenges those same cultural assumptions about blackness, especially when he talks about his son to Tamora's two eldest children. So Tamora sends her other children to kill the baby that she's had illicitly with Aaron, and he's the one that feels for the child. And so he uses a way of challenging the idea that it's okay to kill a baby, even an illegitimate baby, by saying that actually black might not be as bad as colour as white, for example. Because we haven't got a lot of time, moving on, Iago, Iago's a really well-known villain in terms of Shakespearean characters. But there's something interesting if we actually put his keywords together. Um, now, for some reason, his keywords haven't come up on top, but you'll be able to get a sense of Rodrigo and money, for example, are keywords. And I've put them together because of the putting money in his purse speech, which is in Act 1, Scene 3, where you have money occurring 10 times, and you have, effectively, Iago trying to convince Rodrigo to follow them and follow Othello so that Rodrigo can be his scapegoat when he sets up everybody else in the play, basically. So Rodrigo and Money appearing together actually tells you something about where the plot's going. We also have Cassio and the lieutenant, and we ended up talking about Cassio a little bit this morning when we met. Now, what's really interesting about Iago is he's not an obvious villain in the sense that he gets what he does through manipulation of others. He's, he's one of those people that sows seeds, if we thought of him as a real person in, in today's world. So he flatters Cassio to his face, he's the good lieutenant, but we've already found out from him that he's going to set a, a trap almost like Cassio being a spider. And we get this as, as repetition. Now, as, as ends up being a phrase that's repeated several times throughout by Iago to the extent that it explains why as is actually a key word for him. He also uses it with Rodrigo, Rod, Rodrigo, sorry. He says, as sure as you are, in a speech that's about telling Rodrigo that he will never allow, this is Iago, will never allow outward action to reveal what his true intention is inside. And it's in that same speech he says, I am not what I am. Now, a contemporary audience would have heard that as equivalent, but negating what God said, I am that I am. In which case, there's an argument for him self-identifying as a devil at this time. So the key words are doing more than aboutness. They're doing characterization, but they're also doing subtleties of difference between the characters. Um, this is just another example of how he manipulates. So in this case, he's manipulating Othello. I won't read it for you, but I've highlighted where all the keywords are. Where we like the keywords to cluster is because it helps us also indicate whether this is a strong feature of characterization for us. And in this case, it's an example of him trying to say something quite nice about Cassio's professional ability, but he's also saying something about Cassio's ability as a lover because he's trying to convince a fellow that what Cassio's really after is Desdemona. So all of these layered things are happening because of the keywords, but why we're interested in them is do they tell us about deception? Now this is where it gets tricky because in Falstaff's case, no, they don't. Initially, they tell us about his enormous ego. This is someone who engages in extensive self-presentation. So you have him telling us he's withered like an old apple john, he's a villain, he's a rogue, he's admitting um, he's a villain, but he's also saying something that actually seems to contradict that. I am no counterfeit or all key words. So we have to pay attention to that. It's telling us something. It's also providing us an insight into him or what he wants us to believe of him as a character. But it's the antithesis of what's actually true because he says it right at the end when he's trying to pretend he's dead 
and he's also pretended that he's killed Doc Spur, who is dead, but he actually stabbed him after he was dead, so technically then he didn't kill him. And so this is someone who brags a lot, who says he's done all this stuff, who says he fights off attackers, and he's telling us I am no counterfeit, um, I am no counterfeit, when in fact, actually that's exactly what he is, which is where we can go back to uh, con literary theorists like Hayes who've summed up Falstaff to say that his modus operandi is using his wit in an attempt to turn around any discussion or argument to suit himself, but our key word to suggest he's not very good at it. Even in the first play, before he gets found out, he's, he's, he's actually not doing it very well at all. So we wanted to take a second step, which involves doing some deception detection detective work. <laughs> Thank you very much. So essentially, uh, what Don's explored so far is the, the, the keyword analysis. Um, so essentially pointing out what are the, uh, the most prominent uh, keywords in one character over another. And we can see some um, indicators of deception in there that have been suggested by the deception literature um, that's also appearing in the keywords. Now, the second step for us was to explore those same word lists for previously identified cues. So there's a lot of research uh, coming out of psychology and increasingly in linguistics from people like Dawn, myself, um, that are kind of looking for these uh, indicators of deception uh, in language. Um, so I'm going to flash up a, a list here um, of a relatively reliable set of indicators, um, linguistic indicators, that might suggest deception is taking place. Um, so I'm going to use the pronoun usage as a uh, kind of as a, as a mini case study after this. Um, but you can have a read through the others. I mean, an increase in negation, um, emotiveness, um, but in, in particular negative emotion. And we saw some of that coming through in the, in the keyword lists. Um, unnecessary connectors, uh, a decrease in temporal and spatial indicators. So that might indicate a decrease in context and contextual information. Um, a lack of, uh, sorry, extraneous information being provided. Um, exclusivizers, use of stance, and more motion words. So again, that contextual stuff coming through. Um, so this is essentially a list of indicators that we might be looking for, uh, which might suggest deception is taking place. Um, so by way of a, a case study focusing on, uh, on, on pronouns, um, the deception detection literature suggested that there's a, a, a difference between uh, self-references, so by that we mean I, <coughs> me, things like that, um, and other references that we've got up here. So essentially for this little case study, we're comparing the frequency of self-references against other references. Um, so just describing how to, uh, how to read this table, we've got five uh, characters that uh, we've identified as being particularly deceptive, so Aaron, Tamara, Iago, Lady Macbeth, and Falstaff. Um, and then on the right here, we've got the, uh, the characters that have been identified as being particularly blunt or particularly truthful. Um, so for that, we've got Othello, Amelia, Humphrey, Brutus, and Catherine. Um, and as we can see, for other references, um, we've organized it by him, her, he, she, uh, plural, they, them, and then the second person pronouns, uh, so the early modern forms, uh, and you. Um, and then essentially, we've got the frequencies for that. So the top line is the uh, raw frequency, and then the second line is going to be the permanent. Um, and here, what, what we're seeing is that it's, you know, it, as predicted, it's fitting the deception literature. Uh, so the deceptive characters are using more pronouns that are referencing other people. Um, that's been suggested in psychology. It could be some kind of distancing going on. So by, by referring to other people rather than referring to yourself, you know, it takes the shine away from yourself. There's a lack of responsibility from the speaker. Um, so it's talking about other people. Um, and likewise, as we can see from this, uh, in a similar fashion, we've got I and me uh, and we and us for self-references. Um, in a similar way, we've got the deceptive characters and the, the blunt characters up here. Um, and what we're seeing is, uh, is a similar thing. We had slightly here, um, as Don was mentioning about Falstaff in particular, um, he's got this massive ego, um, and that's what we're seeing in his results as well with the, the high proportion of, uh, of I and me, particularly I with Foster. Um, even despite that, though, we're, we're still seeing that it is uh, you know, somewhat low frequencies. So the ultimate aims and the next steps, um, kind of the, the, the remainder of the paper, the, the first part is going to be that keyword analysis. The second part is much more theory-led, looking for the uh, cues to deception. Um, essentially, what we're doing is looking at how the 
deceptive depictions change stylistically, so much more corpus stylistic approach to this, um, but also the realism of the, the, the depictions. Um, as I said, a lot of the research on deception detection is coming from, uh, coming from psychology. Well, to what extent is that uh, applicable to early modern English? Uh, but also to what extent is that applicable to, to, to fictional text as well. Um, th there's been a couple of works that have, that have done that, um, but no, nothing to show you.